joys of obedience. There are many joys of obedience. We may have thought we left obedience behind us, as uh, you guys said, but no. But first of all, well, that is a picture. Can we just cut the lights for a second, Mika? You know which button to press. I think Tidu took this picture in Singapore and put it on, on my timeline. Uh, TJ and Sonia getting married and some old bloke in the middle there. Um, when TJ posted it, the first post underneath, I forget who it was from, might be Sharon, said something like, oh, you look beautiful. And for a moment, I thought they were talking about me. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but possibly it was the bride and groom that she was referring to. Uh, but it was a great privilege to be in Singapore last week. Uh, some of us were there as well. And uh, great to see the church there in Singapore. If you've not visited, you get a chance. Please do go. Um, a church of a thousand or so. Um, in their own building there, and, um, and a very inspiring group that have helped inspire evangelization through the whole of South Asia there, through Indonesia and Thailand and Cambodia and Laos, and um, assisting the work in Japan and all oh, many other places, so Malaysia. So a very inspiring work, very encouraging, and uh, great to be there. Um, and amongst the things that were particularly encouraging, uh, this young lady, sang in the Sunday service, uh, along with another lady, both from Jakarta, Indonesia. Oh. And the woman you're looking at there was the winner of Pop Idol Indonesia uh, for 2016, I think. Oh. And she'd been a Christian a week by the time she did her testimony here. Wow. She just became a Christian. And she did a, a duet with the winner of Pop Idol 2014. Wow. So they're both sisters in Christ. And, uh, wow. Isn't that encouraging? Just to see God moving into the media and all that kind of thing. So, uh, there are lots of stories I could tell you about Indonesia and Singapore. Some from this trip, some from previous trips, including a brother who has a, a, a weekly television slot on national television. Because the government mandate in Indonesia that you have to have religious broadcasting on Sundays. And the, even though it's a Muslim nation, every religion is allowed to broadcast. In fact, has to. You're, you're given a slot. And the Christians have an hour a week. And they've given it to one of the members of the church. Uh, one of the in evangelists from Surabaya in Indonesia. And so he has a, an hour slot to talk about whatever he wants. He's interviewed by the host. And so the host, I've not got time for this story. I don't know. But, um, anyway, the host says, well, you can do what you want. So what, what Johnson, this guy, is called Johnson, from Surabaya does is he gives the scriptures for God the gospel to the host. And so the host asks him the questions from God the gospel. Um, so that he's then able to answer them. So he's basically been teaching the conversion of scriptures for the last couple of years, wow. every Sunday night, across the whole of Indonesia. Wow. So, anyway, some encouraging things from Singapore, from that region of the world. Back to the present. Back to us today. Okay. Let's have a look here at that passage. Um, thank you, Miko. So, uh, obedience. Is obedience attractive to you? What do you think? In what context is obedience attractive? What would you say? In what context? Mika? If it is benefiting us. What was that? <laughs> if it is benefiting us. When it's benefiting us, okay, yeah. When it's easy, obedience is attractive, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a fair point, yeah, yeah, we've got that. Well, we, 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 we get told what, what we should do. Okay, when we get told what we should do, what we'll do. Yeah, there's instruction and guidance. Something specific and concrete and clear, rather yeah. than vague, yeah? Okay, it makes God happy. It creates a great relationship between us and God and protects us. I think obedience is particularly attractive when it's protectional for me or, or leads to other blessings. When is obedience not attractive? When it's difficult. When it's difficult. When it goes against what we like, naturally desire. Okay, it goes against our natural inclinations and, and so on. We don't understand it. Yeah, we're, we're confused about it, we don't understand it. Okay, all right. A number of situations. Um, and what I think sometimes, even spiritually, even as Christians, when we read the Bible, we are afraid of obedience. Mm -hmm. I think there's an inbuilt human uh, rebellion, isn't there, that goes back to Genesis 3 and what happened in Eden. There's a sort of a fear of obedience. We've, I think as Christians, we've got to get over that. And I think, obviously, to some degree we have, or we wouldn't be here. But as we go through the Christian life, it's still important that we don't fear obedience when it is from God and it is for our benefit and benefits our relationship with Him and enables us to be a blessing to the world in the way that God has always planned us to be. So, so we're not talking here about slavish obedience. We're not talking about the kind of obedience where someone's forcing you to do what they want you to do. I'm talking here about a heartfelt, loving obedience of God's commands 
to actually bless us. And although the covenant is different in the new covenant to the old covenant in its detail, nonetheless the heart of obedience I think is still the same. Because it's really about a heart of love for God. Mm -hmm. And so the principles that we see in Deuteronomy in that sense still apply uh, for us today. So hopefully they'll be useful for us. Um, the Deuteronomy, more than any other Bible book, more than the rest of the Pentateuch, or the rest of the Pentateuch combined, uses the word obey or obedience more. It's the book in the Bible that talks the most about obedience, even more than, say, Proverbs, which you might uh, come to mind, or something like that. It's very significant here. And what I hope to do today is to demonstrate that obedience is positive and attractive, and that we will all go away from here wanting, not just willing or reluctantly, fair enough, okay, I'll be obey, but actually have a willing spirit towards obeying God. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that. So that is very important in, in this chapter. So that you may live and go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command. I command you and do not subtract from it. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So why is he giving them these commands? So that they may live, go in, take possession, and ultimately remain in the land, which we'll talk more about later. So that, in the book of Deuteronomy, there are 20 different occasions when you see that, so that. I command you this, so that. And it's either so that there'll be a blessing, or so that you will avoid um, a problem, and a challenge that, to one's faith. So it's a positive thing, but it's also a warning. We have obedience here as a, a command because of, it's a warning against other things. Verse 3, you saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. We talked about this on Friday night. The Baal of Peor was the occasion in Numbers 25 when the uh, men of, uh, of Israel were having uh, sex with the uh, women of Moab, the Moabites, and uh, 25,000 Israelites died in the plague that resulted from that disobedience. So mm -hmm. disobedience has its consequences. Mm -hmm. And we see that even in the sin in our own lives, let alone what, out there in the world. But let's just think about our own lives. The sin before we were Christians, and even the sin as Christians that we've committed, it all has consequences. And so we, this is what God is trying to help us with. I'll give you a little illustration. How many of you remember the raid on Entebbe? Do you remember? I've gone back into the 70s, there was a plane that was taken hostage. Uh, yeah, remember those days? Some of us are old enough, Miko. You and I. Okay, the only ones here are old enough. But uh, a, plane, a plane load of Israelis were taken hostage uh, by some terrorists and flown to Entebbe, which is in Uganda. And the Israeli commandos launched a daring raid on the plane to liberate the Israeli hostages. And uh, there were a hundred of them. And they freed them. They freed a hundred hostages in less than 15 minutes, the whole operation took. They killed, the soldiers killed all seven of the ki uh, kidnappers and set the captives free. However, even though the, the overall operation was successful, three of the hostages were killed during the raid, which was, you know, Tragic, obviously. But why did those three um, hostages die? It's because as the Israeli commanders entered the terminal, where they were being held, they're not on the plane anymore, they're in the terminal. As they entered the terminal, they shouted in Hebrew, get down, crawl on the ground. So of course all the Israeli passengers understood that Hebrew, whereas the uh, terrorists who didn't speak Hebrew didn't understand that. So the, the terrorists remained standing, and all the Israeli hostages fell to the ground, except two of them were a bit like curious, like what, why should we fall to the, what's going on? What's going on around here? And they did not obey the command. And the third one, who initially fell to the ground, he sort of popped up again to have a look and see what was going on. And those three were shot dead. Because they didn't obey the command. So although for the others it was a, a great victory, for those three, it was a tragedy, and they, their lives could have been spared. And so there's something about obedience which is very positive. It rescues us and saves us. But there's something about obedience which is very sobering, which is that there are, there are consequences if we go against God's revealed will for our lives. So this is what we're talking about here. Now, what I would like to do, which I'm not going to do, is read all of the rest of this chapter. 
But given the time that we have today, I don't think that's going to be possible. So we'll dip in and out at various points of the chapter to see uh, the points that I think God may have in mind for us today. So, let's talk about this. Um, why do we obey? Why do we obey God? What did God talk about with the Israelites? What were the reasons he gave as to why to obey? The first thing is we obey so that the world will notice that God is with us. We obey so that the world will notice that God is with us. Not to draw attention to us, but so, so through us they will see that it is God. And, uh, and be, attracted, be drawn to him. Verse 5. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely... This is a wise, this is a great nation, is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? So the idea is that as we obey God, our lives reflect God's love and God, the character of God, such that other people will say, there's something going on here. You're, you're different. Not for the sake of being different, not because we're particularly trying to be different, not because we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but because just as we obey God, something changes inside us. And then people will be attracted to whatever that is, we pray. And that was God's uh, desire for the Israelites, and it's still his desire for us today. Sometimes the best way to attract other people to God is not by telling them about our faith, though that's good, but about just by living our faith and demonstrating by our lives that there is a better way to live than they may already know. Perhaps that's something for us to think about. What do we have that the world needs? We have wisdom, it says here, verse 6, uh, showing your wisdom. And again in verse 8. What a great nation they are. They have all these righteous decrees and laws. These body of laws are so, so good. Um, we don't live by the law, of course, in the sense of salvation, but we do willingly, gladly obey God because we believe him to have the right laws and teachings for us. And so we live free, but we don't make up our own way of living. As Galatians 5.13 says, Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. So we're free. We're not bound by the law, but we are not free to just make up our lives the way we wish them to be. We don't have a, that kind of freedom. Instead, we use our spiritual freedom to serve other people in the way that God serves us and served us. One of our objectives in our annual, uh, you know, the calendar sheet that's handed out all the time, one of our objectives as a church is to be always free yet spiritual. Mm -hmm. Always free yet spiritual. In other words, when we're given two choices of behavior or two choices in, uh, of things to do, we, we think, well, which would be the more spiritual? What would be the more spiritual thing to say? What would be the more spiritual thing to do? In fact, even what would be the more spiritual thing to think? Because that often precedes what we say and what we do, right? For me, that scripture in Colossians 3 is so important. Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated. And set your hearts on things above. Colossians 3, 1, 2, and 3. And so that's a prayer time thing, isn't it? That's how we set our minds and our hearts in the right place. Why is prayer so important? Lots of reasons. But one reason is that it sets our hearts and minds in the right place. And then why is it important to do it in the morning? Well, if I don't set my heart in the right place in the morning, there's, there's less chance it's going to get set right at any other point in the day. And even if it does get set right at another point in the day, it will be after I've spent several hours with my heart and mind maybe not in the right place. Do you see what I mean? So is it a law that we have a morning prayer time? Of course not. If we miss a morning prayer time, does it doesn't mean we're worse than Judas and Satan combined? No, it doesn't mean that. But it's one of those things It's good to develop that healthy discipline of how do I, how do I help my heart and mind to be spiritual? Or maybe some time with God first thing in the day, in his word, praying, is going to help. I know it helps me. Maybe it helps all of us. How, how is that side of things so far this year? We're 15 days into the year, right? Maybe it's great. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not. Wherever we are, today would be a really great day to say, let me, let me set my heart and mind ready for the rest of the year. And have that blessing from God, that strengthening from God. 
always free yet spiritual. I love this thing about the early church um, in James 1 uh, 27 um, and Galatians 6 we see this religion is, uh, is pure and faultless, look after orphans and widows and do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The early church took that very seriously and because there's no NHS and no DSS and no social benefit system the church had to look after its own when they were poor and needy, right? Took this very seriously. They obeyed these commands, even if it was uncomfortable and inconvenient and costly. They looked after one another. And in the early years of the church, into the 200s and 300s, we see this. And there was a, a, an emperor called Julian the Apostate. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have that on my, my tombstone. You know, what, what was your nickname? The Apostate. Uh, the apostate, apostate means one who's left God, gone away from God, rebelled against God. So Julian, uh, so there were some Christian emperors. This is a debatable issue. But anyway, after Constantine, you had some Christian emperors. Julian the Apostate was the first of the emperors of the Roman Empire to say, forget all that. I don't want to be a Christian. This is not going to be a Christian empire. I'm going to go back to paganism. So he tried to turn uh, the Roman Empire back from Christianity towards, the, towards paganism. And um, he didn't make too good a success of it. Fortunately, but um, he was very convicted though by what Christians did and so he said this um, he noticed that Christians obeyed these, these scriptures and he wrote we have a copy of his letter from the 300s AD and he says this it is disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans and Galileans was another word for Christians in his uh, way of thinking the impious, and impious meaning they're not pagans, they should be worshipping pagan gods. The impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men then will see from our people the lack of aid from us. In other words, he's saying, uh, we, the government, the, the Roman Empire, we're not looking after our own. You've got Christians who we don't even like, in fact, who think we think they're infidels. They're looking after not only their own, they're looking after our own. And he was convicted by that, and then he worked, comes up with a plan as to how they're going to tax people to be able to look after the needy and the empire. But that, we have this letter written in that time, because someone who did not believe in God, and in fact actively fought against Christianity, noticed that Christians were obeying these scriptures and taking care of people. You know, the world today, and by the way, if I hear one more person say it wasn't 2016 a terrible year, I think I might punch them. Because <laughs> I... There were some rough things happening in uh, 2016, but the truth is, a few things overshadow all the awesome things. God was alive in 2016. I don't know whether you noticed. I mean, I don't care what happened in America or somewhere else or with Brexit. Honestly, God is still God. And he has a purpose in all things. He didn't necessarily agree or approve of all the things that happened in 2016, but he was still active and powerful. And he is this year. And I think we've got to, we've got to do our bit to live out the kingdom and the kingdom's values such that the world will believe that there is better than this. There is, and God is alive, and he is powerful. And the way that many people will, will do that, will recognize that, is by the way we live. As, not just we be nice people, but we obey God's commands. Mm -hmm. That's the way the world will notice. Are there some things that you could put into practice in your life that maybe would help others to notice that there is a great God who has the wisdom that the world needs? How lucky we are to have uh, this, this wisdom and this power. And this connection with God, it says verse 7, in verse 7, this connection, yeah, the connection with God that we see in John 15, but it's mentioned here in verse 7. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? Near them. Because the pagan gods, they were in the temples. But the Israelite God was near them. He walked with them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. He gave them the tablets of stone. He was the fire on the mountain when Moses went up the mountain. He was there with them, traveling with them. As he travels with us in an even more intimate way. If that was the old covenant, how much more it is the truth now for us who have the Holy Spirit. And we abide in Christ and he abides with us. And we are no longer, he says in this passage, uh, Jesus says, I no longer call you my servants, but my friends. Isn't that an astonishing thought? I mean, I count myself privileged to have many friends amongst us here today. But how more, much more amazing it is, much as I respect all of my friends, but I'm sorry, you're all second class compared to Jesus. <laughs> and that's true for each one of us here, right? I mean, I love my friends, but Jesus, okay. How amazing it is that we have Jesus as our friend. With us, living in us. John 14, 23, living in us. Wow. An amazing thing. We have this connection with God. The Israelites heard his voice, saw his miracles, saw the pillar of cloud, but we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So therefore, uh, we pray. Therefore, we trust God. Therefore, we believe that he is with us as we walk 
together with him. So, second main point. Why do we obey God? We obey God so that the world will know. But we also obey God so that future generations will know God. I want to encourage you to read the rest of chapter 4 if you haven't already done so. We haven't got time to do it right at this moment. But we obey God so that future generations will know. Verse 9, be careful, watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And he repeats that in verses 25 and 26. It's important that we remember what we've been taught and then take the opportunities to teach others so that our work and God's work will go from generation to generation. Not just us, but those who will come after us. Not just us, but those who will still be here when we moved on, either physically to some other location or spiritually and physically from beyond this earth. Either way, we need to, need to leave something behind. And the way that will happen is as we remember what God has done and teach others what God has done. So, remembering what God has taught us. You know, Facebook has this thing now where it pops up now and again. It says, five years ago, you were doing this. Well, here's a slideshow of what you did last week. And I, it's a bit disconcerting because I have to see these pictures and I think, I don't think I was ever there, was I? Oh, no, maybe I was. And, and, but it's kind of cute the way they do that. And it reminds you of things you might otherwise have forgotten. Don't we forget what God has done for us? Yeah. Don't we forget? And one of the most amazing things to do is to sit down with somebody and tell them and ask them, how did you become a Christian? Mm. And I love doing that. Partly because I get a great story from them and it inspires my faith. But partly because I can see the joy in their hearts as they start to tell the story and remember what God did. That's true. Now what happened was... I said, this was in my life, and this was happening, and I went here, and I moved there, and I got this job I never expected to it. And then this person stopped me on the street, or phoned me, or emailed me, or texted me, or messaged me on Facebook, or whatever they did, and said, why don't you come to my church? And then I went along, and there was this person, and that person, and then I studied the Bible, and then I learned this, and, and then I realized that was a sin I didn't realize, and then, oh my goodness. And, 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 and I love to hear the story, but when you see people get into their own story, <laughs> You know, they're so excited. <laughs> and, 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 and the joy that wasn't there has come back. You know, before, a few minutes earlier, they were like, yeah, well, God's good, I guess, but I don't know. And then they remember. Wow. And, and then after that, you're like, what can God do with your life? Like, with your life and through you? Oh, anything. I can do anything with God. And a few minutes earlier, it wasn't the case. And we need to remember what God has done. I'd like to ask you this. What, what is your way of remembering what God has done? I think we need to be intentional about it. God gave the Israelites tablets the, the, and so on. He gave them other memory aids like the ark and then the tabernacle and the things in the ark and stuff and air and stuff. He gave them memory aids. What do we do? Do we journal God's miracles, answer prayers? Uh, do you take a, have a photo album with exciting things that have happened, people you met, people that helped you, people you love, people who blessed your life, people you helped become a Christian or people who helped you? It's important to remember these things because God has done amazing things. He's taught us so much. And when we remember what he's taught us, it helps us to be inspired to teach other people, doesn't it? Uh, 1 Timothy 4, first of all, we need to make sure that we are living what we teach. Let's make sure we're living what we teach. Not perfectly, but living what we teach. If you want to teach someone discipleship, let's walk as a disciple. If you want to teach someone repentance, let's make sure we're repentant of sin. If we want to teach someone how to love, let's make sure we're growing in love. But First of all, let's walk the talk. But secondly, let's also teach, actively teach other people. Get your Bible out and teach someone. Assume, with, with their permission, okay? You can not, not bang them on the head with it um, if they don't like it. But, but actually with their permission, but say, can I share this with you? And that's true for one another, saying, this scripture has helped me. Maybe it can help you. But also with people who aren't yet Christians. They need to hear the word. Yes, your opinions and yes, your experiences. But they also need to hear the word, don't they? And we think, well, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. Is, is one, you know, I don't know enough Bible. The, I think the question is, when will you? I mean, what is enough? Who's decided? I don't, I don't know. I, my, you know Penny, my wife, most of you. I taught her the Bible before I was a Christian. Now you've got to think about this for a minute. So as, as I was being taught the Bible, I was being taught some studies to how to become a Christian. And I was making notes, writing it all down, putting it in a letter. Remember the days of letters before emails? And, okay, this is before those days. No text, no WhatsApp. And so I wrote it all down, two or three pages of A4. I put it in a letter and I posted it to my fiance as she was up in Birmingham. And uh, she took got them and she read them. And then after two or three days, I would ring her on the telephone, a landline. 
<laughs> fixed somewhere in a really long dial thing, you know. And I'd read that and I'd say, what did you think about that, these scriptures? And she'd say, well, I didn't quite understand that one. And that was interesting. And we'd open the Bible on each, uh, on each end of the phone and we'd go through the scriptures again. And I wasn't even a real Christian at that point. I was still studying, right? I didn't know a thing. I didn't know a thing. I only knew what I'd been just taught. But it was enough to pass on to her and she became a Christian. And we're still married 32 years later. Hallelujah. There is a God. So we don't know enough. Well, well, what is enough? Share what you know. You know plenty. Honestly, you may feel inadequate, but that's okay. When we are weak, then we are strong, right? It's the spirit that works through the word, not you. The power is in this anyway, not in you. It doesn't matter about you. Uh, you may be a hypocrite. Uh, if you are, do repent. Uh, so don't be a hypocrite. That's a problem. But not knowing enough, that's not the issue. Amen? Amen. So I'll just wrap up, and then we're going to take communion and take the bread and wine, which is a reminder. It's one of those things God has given us to help us remember what God has done for us. It's a wonderful blessing to do that. Let's take our responsibility to obedience seriously. When we read things in the Bible, let's put them into practice, not out of a slavish obedience, but out of an understanding that God has given these things to us to protect us and to help the world to come to know Him. That's why it's all in there. The world is looking at us. Let's make sure they notice something positive. And that it's from God that's what they notice. During the taking of the bread and wine, we're going to sing the old song, Trust and Obey, which I kind of like and kind of don't like. You know, because obedience is one of those things. It depends how you're feeling. And, uh, but it, the, the, and I'd encourage us to really think about the words of the song as we sing it, because they are really good and really fit with what we're talking about today. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That is true. And obedience, not out of a slavish obedience, but out of a genuine gratitude that God has shown us the way and given us these guidelines and commands. What an amazing thing that is. Of course, as we take bread and wine, we're reminded that we're only in this way of obedience, actually following the example of Jesus, who though he was the Son of God, was obedient Philippians 2 verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He obeyed the will of the Father to go to the cross so that we could be set free for a life of obedience, but motivated and inspired by the obedience of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you so much that so you have shown us the way. And we want to give you the praise and the honour that you truly deserve. For you are a great, merciful, long-suffering and patient God. Which you showed to the Israelites, Father, when uh, they rebelled against you in the desert and many other times. Yet you, you stuck with them, you persevered with them for centuries. And uh, continue to offer, out, offer them your hand of love and protect them. And, and now, God, we have the new covenant. But you sent Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, the provider of our salvation, the, the one in whom there was perfect obedience. Though Israel was not perfect in obedience and neither are we, yet Father, the one who was perfect in obedience, tempted by sin in every way as we are, yet without sin, he came so that he could provide the sacrifice that was necessary for us to be right with you, for our sins to be forgiven, for us to receive the Holy Spirit. Father, we're grateful for that. We pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work in us to help us to be obedient to your word such that we would enjoy the promises that come with that. We'd avoid the pain that otherwise we would have and God also, that we could show the world that you are God and that you know what is right and you know the right way to live and you know what's right to believe and you have a good plan for humankind. We pray that prayer, Father, which is uh, the Lord taught us when he said, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. We pray that we'll do your will on earth as it is done in heaven, so that the kingdom can be spread, can, can grow, and people can understand what that really means. Thank you for Jesus Christ. We take this bread and wine now in gratitude and remembrance of what he has done. Amen.